my name is Howard Campbell. I'm chair of sociology and anthropology at UTEP, and I'm really glad that everyone's here. I just wanted to say one real quick thing. Uh, people have mentioned that this El Paso Juarez zone is a very important one for topics of kidnapping and crime, but so also is UTEP. We, we're actually the founding institution of the field of border studies. Most of our students are from the border, and they know a lot about these topics. But our university and its future and study of this kind of uh, data is somewhat threatened by the appointment of a new president of UTEP, who is a woman named Heather Wilson, who's currently the secretary of the Air Force. Uh, a Trump appointee. She's be going to become the president of UTEP in August. And so we'll see if we can continue to study in Juarez and to study crime, to criticize the U.S. government and the Mexican government and so on and work for human rights with this new president. But without further ado, uh, let me move to our session, which is entitled Kidnapping, Immobility, and Frontier Spaces. And hopefully we can build on Jeremy's question about the geography of kidnapping and crime. Uh, we have three excellent uh, presentations. Two of them at least are going to be in Spanish. The first one, uh, Laura Gallego and Gustavo Duncan concerning Medellin. So why don't we begin with that one then? Yes, of course. Oh, Spanish? Spanish. All right. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, bueno, uh, la, la presentación, uh, y muchas gracias por la invitación. Ah. Uh, thanks for the... Oh, oh sorry. Oh, <laughs> let me take this. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, going to say that in English. All right, yeah, we can uh, we can do it. If you can, it's just like yeah, yes, I will do it in English. Okay. All right, yes. Uh, thanks for the invitation. <laughs> no. yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, um, th this is a actually a, a paper. Uh, we are working about policing and uh, state destruction in contemporary democracies. Uh, it's about the role of organized crime in policing and how they became like a, a micro state inside the, within the, uh, the state. Uh, I am focused the presentation on the impact of this in, of course, kidnapping, but also in confinement. Uh, displacement and violence against uh, civilians. Um, first, I'm going to present the argument. I'm going to uh, present it briefly. Uh, as uh, any of you who has studied political science know that uh, war it has played a central role in the uh, state-making process in Europe. There are a lot of authors uh, talk about that. But all, not all in state making was about war. There was another form of coercion. And we, f uh, we focus um, in policy as a, as a form of coercion. What is policy for us? Basically, uh, coercion oriented toward justice, surveillance, and punishment of the society within the same uh, state. And what had happened in the European process was that uh, the Bavarian idea of the state, like the interpretation of a monopoly of, 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 of coercion, was basically was, was based, based not only in war, uh, around wars, but also in the monopoly of policing activities. So now we have the state nation, now we have the Bavarian monopoly, but this is the idea is a, a quite an, a, an illusion, because in many uh, circumstances, what we can find is that uh, in, in the society, some other uh, organizations, different to the state, uh, offer uh, policy functions. They surveil, they enforce justice, and they punish the population, acting like uh, the state. So, uh, and, and there are authors like Barese that show that even in England, some criminal organization provide this type of service. Duffield Wars in, in Africa, Yusura Marino in, in Africa, uh, they all have shown the, uh, uh, the, the phenomena. Uh, in my work, I have, uh, in the particular case of drug trafficking, I talk about oligopolies of coercion. Oligopolies of, of coercion is, is a situation in which the state share with criminal organization Essential policing activities such as uh, surveillance, justice, and um, um, punishment. 
and why the state decide to, they decide to delegate those functions in, in this uh, organization? Well, basically because it's finding convenient, uh, and that's, uh, I'm going to explain that later. Uh, and, but there is a problem with the oligopolies of coercion uh, for the state, because uh, the state Okay, there are some organizations uh, ruling these uh, part of these are the communities of this part of society. They are not problematic because this part of society are, are not of the interest for, for the state or for the for the elites. Uh, uh, but eventually, oops, sorry. <laughs> 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 All right, I, I'm going to talk about uh, this case in Medellin. Um, Eventually, there is too much accumulation of power by the mere fact of uh, offering policy uh, activities and eventually can uh, challenge uh, the state. And, of course, challenge democracy with uh, monopolies or function uh, of, with guarant uh, guarantee, of course. They are going to break uh, all the notions of guarantee of democracy. When we talk about these oligopolies of coercion, we are not talking about the typical rebels, like Marxist rebel, because these organizations, uh, they pretend to replace the state, and they have an idea of creating a new nation state. I mean, to topple the government and to create a new sort of, of state and a new sort of uh, society. No, no, no. Uh, this organization, the criminal organization, are oriented toward making like a, a a community state, a state for certain communities, and now they are the law in this uh, community. In fact, one of the reasons they are so efficient is because the state uh, making the war against this organization is stronger by far. I mean, co uh, countries like Mexico and Colombia are not weak states. They have an army, they have the police, they have the means to crush this organization, but they don't have the means to rule in a daily basis. They cannot offer justice, they cannot offer surveillance, and they cannot offer punishment like this organization uh, uh, do. Okay, what happened here? All right, I think there was another, but anyway, okay. Uh, I don't know what happened, but it's, it's the late today, <laughs> yes. Uh, Oh my God, there is something wrong there. But anyway, uh, what used to happen is uh, that policy, uh, and, and all the studies uh, of the author about policy talk about two different types of police. One is the high police and the other is the low police that we call it moral police. The high police or political uh, policing is about the defense of power holders and the political regime. Uh, in the medieval, uh, in the medieval Europe, you can find that the kings have the means to neutralize any pretender of, of the power, or the same with a dictator of a banana republic, and the same KGB. In the KGB, I, I don't know if you have seen this movie of the death of Stalin, all the conspiration to replace uh, Stalin. Uh, but we can find all, all, uh, also the political police, the political police in the same democracies. Democracies defend the regime and the political system from terrorists, from Marxist rebellion, and so on. Uh, and uh, a final point: this is not only about uh, neutralizing, I mean, murdering, incarcerating. Uh, potential conspirators, but also is trying to keep the order in the in the daily behaviors, uh, habits, uh, and exp uh, uh, expressions. Um, an example of a political police in this sense is the Inquisition. What the Inquisition did is to avoid that in the behaviors of the population, uh, some sort of well, oh, insurrection again, religious belief of Catholicism uh, arose. Uh, oh, now it appears. <laughs> and there is the uh, moral, uh, what we call moral police, uh, in a, uh, using the Barrington Moore book about injustice, the social basis 
obedience and rebellion. He talked about that whoever is in charge in a society uh, of have to offer some uh, so, some modicum uh, protection and justice uh, to the population. Um, the, the, the different uh, states and authorities across time offer in a way or another. But what we have found is that uh, in, uh, just until the modernity, the state assume that function directly. Usually is the, the same society or, or, ma or organized crimes or there are different type of organization from the same society that offer this service. And here is the history. Uh, we can Greece, Rome, feudal society, they created the, this type of, of, of organization. I'm going to, to go really fast uh, in this part because we don't have too much time. But uh, there were some important changes in the, in the 19th century because uh, the modern police, or the police corps, like we, uh, as we know today, uh, were created in the 18th and 19th century in France and in, in England. Also, there is a, a book of, of Foucault, Vigilar y Castigar, I don't know the translation, Punish. to punish. Uh, so, yes, uh, uh, the, the, this is about how the punishment uh, went from a physical punishment in public to a private um, uh, and, uh, and just incarceration. So there are uh, big changes in the nature of uh, that internal coercion of the state. And in the 20th century democracy, not only uh, uh, monopolized the, the, co the coercion, at the interior of, of, of the inside, within the, the state, but also created a, uh, rational guarantees for policy uh, activities like media control, human rights, and so on. Okay, but something else uh, happened is uh, that uh, we have the problem, as I mentioned pre uh, previously, that with oligopolies of coercion, and eventually, uh, the oligopolies of, 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 of coercion cre cre created a situation in which this organization accumulate too much power by a, sector, uh, by, a, by a certain policy that they are able to challenge uh, the state. Well, um, this, is, uh, this, this map shows the magnitude of the population that in South in Latin America live now under uh, the rule of criminal. But uh, this is by Benjamin Lessing. He made this estimation. Uh, it's a really conservative one. Every square is a million of inhabitants. So you can see how many inhabitants in Latin America are living now under the rule. I mean, uh, that some sort of policy is offered by criminals organization. We are talking about more than 10 million of inhabitants. This is a really huge problem, a really problematic problem in the making a, a state process and in the democratic institutions. Now I'm going to show you the case of Medellin. Uh, I'm going to go over the methodological issues because we don't, we don't have time. Um, uh, Medellin problem began in the 1970s. Uh, the city was in, in, in the middle of an uh, economic uh, crisis. The elites cannot offer enough job to the uh, population. This was a rich uh, city, by the way. This was not a poor one. Uh, it was famous because there was an industrial sector, uh, a strong industrial sector. But in the 70s, there, the, there was an economic crisis. And uh, there was also immigration from the countryside to the uh, Europe, to the to the city, and a period, a lot of criminal groups, uh, like a part of a criminal subculture, uh, and they created a lot of band, but a bad band dedicated to robbing banks, to robbing casas de cambio, like uh, money chain, carros de valores. How do you say this? Anyway, there were some sort of uh, a big sophisticated uh, thief, 
Uh, these were in the poor neighborhoods, but they were integrated. In the new neighborhoods, the poorest one, uh, some uh, sort of uh, some gangs emerged, um, but the same community created vigilante groups uh, in order to attack them. There is a really good movie, and uh, if you follow, you think that the yesterday movie was uh, really hard to to watch. You have to see this movie. It's La Mujer del Animal. The Woman of the Animal. This movie is about sexual violence during the 70s. And one of the reasons that the vigilante groups were created was to protect uh, the women against sexual uh, violence in, in Medellin. But really soon, this group acquired some sort of uh, 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 policing capacity. I mean, they offered justice, they surveilled uh, uh, the community and punished the offenders. In the south side of the city, which is the, uh, the, the, the rich part, there were also an important, uh, there were also an important smuggled sectors. I mean, uh, professional criminals that dedicated to bring counterfeit uh, to the city. And they make a transformation. They, uh, in the 70s, they not only bring uh, uh, counterfeit, but also they began to export cocaine. And among them, there was a guy who I am sure you know him. Ah. Is this guy? You see it? <laughs> Pablo Escobar. Uh, and this guy uh, have a, a really good idea uh, um, in terms of criminality. He realized in that in the neighborhood of the city, there were a lot of bandits, a lot of gangs, a lot of vigilantes ruling, uh, oops, <laughs> ruling the, uh, uh, the, the, the communities. And he thought, okay, I'm going to make politics. I'm going to give them money from drug trafficking, but they are going to be my army, my private army. So if you live in Medellin, I want to traffic drug, you have to pay Escobar, and Escobar is going to give money to all these criminals. That is the reason I say uh, plata in exchange for plomo. So Pablo Escobar controlled the Medellin cartel uh, by controlling the bandits in the communities. No one can uh, contest Pablo Escobar because he is going to concern 5,000 or 7,000 armed army, uh, bandits. Uh, they really soon began uh, the, uh, the de facto social control. They became the local state, and they provided policy activities, as I told you later. But Escobar was really, really ambitious, and he decided, okay, this is not enough for me. I am controlling the Medellin cartel. Now I want to control the state. And he decided to make the war against the state. And he did the war against the state using this uh, army. And the state... Cannot was not able to enter to this community because if the state enter, have to enter shooting. But they don't know who in that community is going to be part of the Escobar armies. Also, and this is important for, for, for the workshop, whoever entered that community and people uh, don't, and the, uh, the bandits don't know who is he, he, have, uh, he, he run the risk of being murdered because it's suspicious of being an informant of the police or of the state. And that was the, the, the nature of war. Uh, in this case, Escobar accumulated a lot of power by the exercise of police in, uh, activity in order to challenge the state. In a given moment, Escobar opted for the bandits, not for the drug trafficker. This is, this is a, a big long history and he's showing narco, but he has to, sh to choose or he support the bandits who made the violence, or support the drug trafficker who made the money. And he choose bandits who made uh, violence. But Escobar ran, uh, uh, ran out of, of money. So in order to fi finance the, the war, he have to kidnap. And he kidnapped uh, the, rich, uh, the traditional race of Medellin, but also other drug traffickers. So kidnapper was used as a means of war. Also, for political reason, he kidnapped the, the relative of the national elites and national oligarchies. But that was political because he was pressing to the political class in Bogota to introduce a change in the new constitution. And that change was that extradition 
was going to be abolished. No longer the drug traffickers were going to be abolished. Uh, as you know, Pablo Escobar was murdered by Los Pepes, perseguidos por Pablo Escobar, which was basically the paramilitary group. In fact, the modern paramilitaries of Colombia in the 90s was born there, not in the mass. I mean, mass is a myth, like uh, this, the origin of paramilitaries. It's not like that, but, but that's another long e history. This guy, the paramilitaries, murdered Escobar, helped the state to murder Escobar, but after that, they have to subjugate all the criminal groups that Escobar left. And it took like three, four years to do that. But finally, this guy, Don Bernard, the leader in Medellin, subjugated this guy, and he keep with the, uh, the, the, with the provision of policing activities. He said, okay, guys, keep ruling on your communities. But now we are going to change our relation with the state. Now we are not going to class the state, but we are going to deal with the state and when we are going to provide order for the city. And they stopped doing certain criminal activities that were so harmful for the, for the society, but they introduced new activities. Like what? Like selling drugs. They created monopoly of drugs, monopoly of arepas, that then later I show you in a photo, you're, you're, a picture you're going to love a lot. And they teach to the criminals how to produce their own uh, uh, rents and how to deal with the police. All right, I, I know, I, I, let me just one minute, two minutes, please. Then there is another war, and now we have, uh, and, and, the, uh, and now we have uh, a new situation, which is a part uh, of our research we are making now with the University of Chicago and IPA about how the criminal organized crime wars uh, today in Medellin. Now there is not a big couple like Don Berna, like Escobar, no. There is a split between international drug trafficking and local criminality. The local criminalities have to live or they own rents. And there, these rents come from uh, extortion, they come from uh, monopolies of drugs, monopolies of, of arepas. There is also a process of crime of domestication. These guys are not murdering as they used to murder. Look at the rate of murder in Medellin. It's really low now. We are in a peaceful time. How will he get it? The corruption of the police play an important role here. You, have, you are a criminal. You have a plaza de vicio. I mean, a monopoly selling drugs in one part. You have to pay the police. But that's not enough. You have to behave. Because if you murder someone, if you uh, make noise, your links with the police are going to be eroded. And the police decided, okay, you don't serve, you don't, have to, you don't know how to keep order, we are going to arrest you. So in order to produce money, this guy has to produce order. Now we have peace or a small war. There is a war in Medellin now. And by the increasing of homicide, it is, you don't feel it like the, I mean, like the massacre of the massacre of the 90s, uh, 90s. There is a process of rationalization. Okay, let's keep with this. And uh, uh, this is not as maps is just to show you the level of governance by the criminalities. In all these places of the city, which is most of the city, there are some sort of criminal organization ruling. Except in uh, police function. This is a, a, a sample of so 80 neighborhoods. We make a, a surveys. Um, uh, the dark one is, uh, in this case, who, uh, who, who intervenes uh, if the state or the, or, the, or, or, or the criminals or both of them. Uh, the right one, the clear one, is the, the criminals, and the darkest one is the, the state. So it looks uh, the, 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 the state and criminal share policy functions. I mean, there is a parallel uh, state. Uh, this is the picture that, that is very funny because these guys were uh, arrested and what you find there is arepa, it's like tortillas. Uh, because they, they have the monopoly of arepa, so only they can sell the arepas. And there is aguardiente, it's a liquor, and they uh, hire it 
a guy who worked in the in a, in a factory, in a legal factory, and now they produce their own liquor with the same quality, and they have the monopoly of that uh, liquor. That's the reason they, they became so peaceful, because uh, uh, war is too bad for business. Um, uh, conclusion, and I want to make my conclusion thinking about the topic of of, of, of this uh, workshop. Uh, I'm going to the to the third one because I have uh, I have talked uh, previously about the two ones, and I, I, and I want I, I, I want to show that kidnapping in this context has to be understood under the follower uh, the following rationality. This is a mean for a realm of extraction, but also is a mean of political domination. I mean, with kidnapping, this organization are decided who can live in a certain place, who be belongs to the communities, to the political community they rule, and who can uh, uh, who cannot, uh, who does uh, uh, who does uh, belong. Also. There is an are invisible frontiers, and in, in a regular basis, that is mentioned in the in the media of Medellin. They talk about invisible front frontiers, fronteras invisible. What that means, when there is war uh, between a group and another, the civilian cannot cross the borders because any of them can be an informant for the enemy. So we are uh, we are going to find uh, a lot of cases of uh, confinement or displacement and victims like the yesterday documentary that were murdered just simply because they were suspicious of being part of uh, of the other groups so we don't we 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 have to stop thinking the, the of, of these communities like nations this guy are not thinking about nation not like benedict anderson famous book the community is defined by other uh, factors like being part of that uh, community or being part of uh, of the networks, knowing the other person, sharing some sort of identities that are defined at the, uh, 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 the local uh, level. Most of, of, of that factors are going to define the logic of violence and, of course, kidnapping and other uh, crimes of mobility. Oh, thank you. Um, try it to be brief. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Gustavo.